Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I'm Mark Fernandez, and I'm joined today by the one and the only, the legend, Mr. Bob Gale. Bob, how are you, sir? I am as good as can be expected under the circumstances. Yeah. Which is my, my pet, pet, pet answer these days. I keep hearing that, but the circumstances uh, for me haven't been terrible as of the last of uh, you know year. So I, I can't uh, jump on that bandwagon, but for you either, right? You, you're you're just uh, coming back from the um, uh, Back to the Future musical opening in London. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. Well, that was that was that was in September. So it's been uh, it's been a few months uh, since we officially opened. Um, no, I was just referring to uh, 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 COVID madness and 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 so forth. Un- understood. <laughs> understood. Understood. Um, so um, the the musical, I actually, you know, and obviously we're kind of jumping to the end before we get back to the beginning because I'm so intrigued. I want to talk USC. I want to talk about your upbringing and all that kind of stuff. But the musical, I first of all, I'm kind of a musical junkie. You know, it's like kind of one of my uh, um, guilty pleasures. When when I left, you shouldn't you shouldn't be guilty about that, Mark. <laughs> right, no right. reason to be guilty. It's it's, it's uh, you know. <laughs> People like you are, are the reason that uh, this whole industry exists. So uh, yeah, I yeah. apologize. It's one of the things that I miss the most about New York City. Uh, when I lived there um, on Wednesdays, um, you could get uh, matinee tickets uh, right. because, you know, Wednesdays, you know, the older folks would come in and like they have shows during the day. Um, and I always would get great Wednesday matinee tickets, sneak out of work and go check out all the, you know, musicals on Broadway. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, that's one of the big things that I miss about New York is the theater scene. But tell me a little bit about how the Back to the Future musical kind of came together and and what's been the reception of it thus far? Well, the reception of it has been fantastic. Uh, we couldn't be happier with the way that uh, audiences are responding to it and, uh uh, we're getting good crowds, even uh, even with the pandemic going on. Mm. Um, although things have loosened up a lot looser in London than than they are in New York right now. That's for darn sure. Sure. Um, sure. But the uh, it, it all got started actually when uh, Bob Zemeckis and his wife Leslie saw the producers uh, in New York, and uh, they loved it, and they're coming out of the theater and. Leslie says to Bob, have you ever thought about doing a stage musical out of Back to the Future? Right. And Bob right. kind of said, well, no, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I think I'll kick that around with Bob Gale. So uh, uh, when Bob got back, he said, uh, hey, Leslie had this idea. What do you think about this? And I said, well, that's kind of like what he said. It's interesting. I'm, we'll have to think about that. And we kind of let it uh, gestate for a while. And I never got a chance to see uh, the producers on Broadway. But when the movie of the musical came out, uh, I saw how good the, the movie was and how cleverly they uh, translated the uh, the movie to the stage, right, right. to the musical format. I said, okay, I, I get this. I, I, see, I see what we could do here. And so we got a hold of... Uh, Alan Silvestri, because he's the first call you're going to make if you're going to do oh, musical wow. Back to the Future. You want it to sound like Back to the Future. You better yeah, get the guy yeah. that made Back to the Future sound like Back to the Future yeah. in the first yeah. place. And uh, Bob and Al knew uh, Glenn Ballard, songwriter, because he'd worked with them on uh, the songs on Polar Express. And they say, hey, you guys, you got Bob, Gail, you got to meet Glenn. You, you'll love this guy. And I did. And so we had this meeting in February 2006 and we kicked some ideas around and thought, all right, let's uh, let's uh, let's run with this and see what happens. And those guys uh, went off and they wrote a few songs and they came back and played them for us. And we said, "Okay, this is cool. We can we should do this. We should do this. Now, what was interesting is that we thought um, all of us. Okay, Back to the Future, it's a known quantity. Producers are going to be lined up around the block 
You can sure. make a music out of this, right? <laughs> nope, they weren't. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we uh, uh, so think think about this. 2006 is when we start, you know, seriously thinking about this, uh, and 15 years later in 2021. Uh, it opens on the West End. Well, in 1980 uh, is when I thought of the idea for Back to the Future. Ten years later, uh, by the summer of 1990, we'd already made three Back to the Future movies. Right. So we made in, the, in the space that and, – and we started off with Back to the Future as an idea, and nobody knew what it was uh, with the movies. So here we are. Uh, with the stage show, and everybody ought to know what this is. Right. And, right. Uh, they, you know, they kept telling us, oh, it really takes a long time to get a musical mount. really takes a long time. And we're thinking, ah, it's back to the future. It's not going to take that right. much right. time. Yeah, it took that much time. So, so but, um, um, go ahead. I, I have, um, like, some echo coming in. Could you um, go down to that little gear? Do you see the little gear at the bottom that yeah. says Cam Mike? Click on that and see if echo cancellation is on. Under audio, if you click the little uh, oh, gear. Okay. Echo cancellation. It's on now. All right, cool. All right, check, check, check. All right, much better. All right, much better. Okay, sorry. No worries, no worries. I'll cut that out. No worries. Um, the um, So... I, I've never seen the musical, but I have been doing my research online about it. And from what I can gather from afar, um, there's an interesting kind of high concept going on there that the musical is a combination of original songs kind of based on some of the famous lines in the movie, as well as sort of re of, of performances of some of the big songs that were used in the movie, like the power of love, for example. So, yes. So we've got in the, in the movie, I mean, I'm sorry, in the, in the show, we've got power love back in time is the, is the curtain call number, uh, earth angel and Johnny be good. Just like, cause they're part of the story. Right. So sure. those, those, those are the four numbers from the movie, uh, that are in the show. And, uh, Al and Glenn put lyrics, to the Back to the Future theme, uh, and it's called Only a Matter of Time. Only a Matter of Time. Right. So, um, so, so you'll hear that theme. And there's a lot of score, uh, which is, I think, kind of unusual in a, in a musical um, because the guys that write songs for musicals, they're not, um, you know, they're, they're, they don't compose scores as... That's not their bread and butter. Um, so we have a lot of familiar uh, musical motifs uh, from the movie. You know, the clock tower sequence, you'll say, oh, yeah, God, that's the same music that, that we heard in the, in the movie. And it absolutely is. So there are a few places like that where we, you know, Al reorchestrated and, and rejiggered uh, the music from the movie for the show. That's awesome. Uh, what one thing now that you know, kind of maybe take you know, get into the DeLorean and travel back in time, travel to roughly 1970, I want to guess. But um, you, as a young student at uh, USC, um, and were you at USC studying uh, film? Yes, um, I was actually an engineering student in 1970 at Tulane, and. Um, decided that I didn't like engineering. And so I transferred to USC because I found out that they had film school, a film school there. Uh, and uh, filmmaking had been a hobby of mine in high school. And uh, a guy in my dorm at Tulane uh, who knew how frustrated I was with engineering because he was another engineering student and he was frustrated with it too. He said, you know, they got film schools in California. If you make your hobby into your career, then it won't feel like you're going to work every day. Yeah. Great, so, great, yeah that's kind of a good idea. Great. It's great advice. And then when, when, when you're at film school, you just happen to 
be in the same class with Robert Zemeckis. Exactly. And which is exactly. which is which is quite an amazing, um, you know, fortuitous kind of meeting of the of the minds. Did you guys become friends right away, or? Yeah, we did. We did. Um, we were back in those days. Uh, there were, I think, there were forty-seven students in our class. Uh, only twenty percent of us were undergrads. So the undergrads kind of hung out with each other, and you know, we're talking, you know eight, nine, 10 guys. And right. uh, um, uh, Bob and I both, um, we both wanted to make Hollywood style movies. We wanted to make, you know, James Bond, Dirty Harry, The Great Escape, stuff like that. Those were the movies that uh, that got us excited, uh, the, the classic Disney stuff. And Bob and I discovered that we had exactly the same taste in in movies, he wanted to be a director. I want to be a writer, mm -hmm. and so it just seemed natural that we uh, we started hanging out together, uh, working together, and uh, we decided that uh, when we got out of school, we weren't going to mess around with trying to be apprentices or any of that stuff. We were going to try to figure out how to make a movie right out of school, and so before we even graduated, we started collaborating on a script. I had this idea about a vampire movie where um, the vampires masqueraded as as uh, prostitutes in a uh, bordello and the uh, they slept in the bordello was upstairs of a mortuary showroom so they could sleep in the coffins in the daytime oh, that's perfect. Uh, that became that became bordello of blood and 17 years later uh, it's made into a movie tales from the crypt presents Bordello of Blood, oh, wow. which I do not recommend. It's not a good picture. <laughs> they, Is it based were, on your script? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We good. were we were totally rewritten by the guys that made the movie. Um, and it's, it's say it's not it's not good, but it's the lesson is don't ever throw don't ever throw anything away. Right, uh, and in the in the early seventies, um, you also. A film that I haven't seen, I must confess, but when I was looking uh, up and researching, I actually thought it was quite interesting. You and Robert Zemeckis collaborated on a film called I Want to Hold Your Hand in 1978. Um, and the description that I read, it's about a group of kids taking a road trip to go see the Beatles perform live in concert. Um, is this is this right? Am I getting this right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the kids from New Jersey, they're trying to crash the Ed Sullivan show when the Beatles first appeared in 1964. And for those who are interested, it's a really good picture. I must say if this many years later, it, it holds up quite well. And uh, there's a fabulous looking uh, Blu-ray uh, that Criterion came out with. Oh, so wow. if, you're, uh, if you're a film buff and uh, you must, then if you're a film buff, you know about the Criterion collection and uh, it's, uh, they did a great transfer of it. Um, and, uh, there's uh, a 40 minute special feature that has uh, Spielberg, Zemeckis and me uh, sitting around and uh, reminiscing about it. So uh, and, and what, was, what, what was Spielberg's involvement in that one? Stephen was the executive producer. We uh, uh, by this time, we uh, met Stephen through our mentor, John Milius, oh, who wow. hired us uh, to write 1941. Sure, sure. Which is your first uh, big screenwriting credit, right? Yes, yes, yeah. that's right. I mean, 1941 came out after I Want to Hold Your Hand, but it was written, we started writing that in 1975. And um, uh, we did, uh, Stephen, John was telling, John and Stephen were good friends, and John was telling Stephen about these two lunatics uh, that he'd hired to write this crazy script, and uh, that there was a dog fight, uh, a plain dog fight over Hollywood Boulevard. And, uh, they shot up, the Japanese shot up a Pacific Ocean amusement park. Stephen said, I got to read this. I got to read this. So Stephen read uh, <clears throat> our second draft and he said, I got to direct this. Mm -hmm. So uh, we ended up going down to uh, Mobile, Alabama while Stephen was shooting uh, Close Encounters and did rewrites in 1941. Uh, you know, while Stephen was shooting. 
We knew with Stephen at night. We'd hang out on the set, and uh, it was it was <laughs> good times. So anyway, yeah. that's how we got to know Stephen. And uh, when we while we were there, we'd already pitched. I want to hold your hand uh, to a couple producers at Warner Brothers, who end up being the producers on the movie. Alex Rose and Tara Marasev. <clears throat> and Warner Brothers, of course, said, well, we're not going to green light you guys writing the script until we know we can get the rights to some of these early Beatles songs. Right, of course, right. They were right to do that. And it took eight or nine months for them to make that deal. So we're down in Mobile and we get a phone call saying, OK, they cleared the rights. You guys can come back. And start writing the script. So we came back. We wrote the script. Uh, Stephen said, well, let me read it. Let me read it. And he read it and loved it and said uh, to Bob, hey, you ought to direct this. And uh, Bob said, well, yeah. But at that time, Warner Brothers had a ironclad policy against first time directors. They right. got yeah. burned a couple of times uh, on the uh, <clears throat> hiring hippies to direct movies after Easy Rider came out. <laughs> and uh, Steven signed on as executive producer. Uh, helped get the movie out of Warner Brothers over to Universal, where he had his solid relationship with uh, CEO Sidney Scheinberg. And we set the project up over there. Stephen is executive producer of I Want to Hold Your Hand. Uh, and that's Bob's first uh, directing, feature directing job. Yeah, it's a great story. Um, and and um, I, I also... I must admit that I, I I learned this today, but it's been haunting me ever ever since I heard it. That the the kind of the seed of the inception of your idea for Back to the Future was this concept of you. Um, if you were to meet your dad when he was a kid, would you and your dad be good friends? And, exactly. And and that's such a powerful concept. Um, was that was that. Was that the the seed that everything kind of grew out of? Yes, absolutely. I found my father's high school yearbook uh, in summer of 1980. Uh, I was back visiting my folks in uh, St. Louis, and um, for some reason, I I was searching for something in the basement, and I found my dad's high school yearbook. Yeah, discovered that he'd been the president of his graduating class, something I didn't know, and I thought about president of my graduating class, who was somebody I would have nothing to do with. And I thought, gee, was my dad one of those kind of guys? Right. The school spirit, rah-rah types that I couldn't stand. And would I have been friends with him? And that was it. That was the uh, proverbial lightning bolt that struck me and said, there's a good time travel story. Because Bob and I had always been fascinated by trying to figure out, well, how we how can we do it? time travel movie we had seen uh the george pal uh version of uh hg wells a time machine when we were kids mm-hmm. made a huge impression on us you know we loved all the time travel twilight zone episodes and, and and so forth so we were always kicking around a time travel idea but we could never come up with the hook and once i i had this epiphany with my with the high school yearbook thing when i came back to california i said bob I figured out our time travel movie and uh, he loved it. And he said, yeah, wouldn't it be cool if if your mom went to the same high school and uh, you know, all the stuff that she told you about never, uh, never doing anything with a boy turned out to be bogus. (laughs) That's how it all, that's how it all happened. Wow. That's incredible, man. I, I consider, and it's funny. uh, My last guest on the podcast was, was, uh, was Alan Ball who, um, you know, wrote American Beauty. And I was was telling Alan that there's only, I think that there's only about five perfect movies ever made. I consider American Beauty one of those movies. Um, I also consider Back to the Future one of those movies. Thank Um, you. And uh, Oh, thank you. Um, And um, it's funny because the, um, in my last company uh, that I ran, I ran a company called Collider. It it, it was a movie entertainment uh, media site. Oh, and, yeah. Isn't that still around? Yeah, yeah. It's still around. I sold it. I sold it back in December. Um, okay. But when I was, you know, when I was still running it, um, to kind of treat myself, I would do screenings at the Arclight. <laughs> um, and, and one of my favorite screenings that I ever did, and we would invite the fans, and it would be like a big event. We did a screening of Back to the Future 
maybe two years ago at the Arclight. Um, and I got to see it in an audience uh, or, or, or in a theater full of people and at my age now, and the movie holds up so well. And it's it just, does, so, yeah. it it's just so, it's, it's just so damn perfect. And um, that opening of, 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 uh, of uh, Michael J. Fox with the guitar and the gigantic speaker, and then him saying, "Oh man, I'm I'm late," you know, like the, it, it was brilliant because he thought it was eight a.m., but but uh, Doc Brown really said it, so it was eight twenty-five, and he's late for school. So it's already in the first opening scene you introduce time as an in incredibly important character in the story. Uh, hey, the first thing you see are clocks. Let's face right. it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, right. and that's our that's one of our our several homages to uh, to the George Powell movie, because that's how the George Powell movie starts off, too. Yeah, that's great. And, and how long did you slave over the screenplay? Was it the kind of thing that kind of wrote itself? I mean, nothing ever really does that. But was it was it a arduous process to get that first draft ready? Well, uh, not really, I'd say, in that. Yeah, well, I'm think, thinking back on it. We we pitched the idea to Columbia in September of 1980, and the first draft was uh, February 1981. So, and what was the tagline, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, like, like, do you remember, like, when people say, "What's the elevator pitch?" Do you remember what that initial elevator pitch for back? Oh yeah, the yeah, was? yeah. A kid goes back in time, meets his parents when they were his age, and his mom falls in love with him instead of his dad. It's, it's, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And, and, and people must have looked at you like you had three heads when you pitched them something like that. Well, actually, it was the easiest pitch meeting we ever had. Wow. Um, we went. Uh, Frank Price was uh, uh, was a president of Columbia Pictures at the time, and uh, we just made a movie there called Used Cars, uh, which uh, again, those of you uh, checking out this podcast, if you're not familiar with it. It's a pretty funny movie. It's uh, where I want to hold your hand is PG and relatively sweet. Uh, used cars is rated R and it's raunchy or don't get out. Kurt Russell <laughs> and Jack Warden uh, playing uh, battling used car dealers. Anyway, uh, Frank Price loved used cars, even though the movie didn't do well. And he said to us, when you guys have your next idea, please come to me first. I want to be in business with you again. That's so cool. we pitched this to Frank and we had a whole bunch of other stuff that we were going to tell him and he got it immediately. And Zemeckis wanted to keep telling him more stuff. And I kept going, shut up, shut up. He gets it. He's going to, he's going for it. Don't, you know, don't queer the deal here. So um, yeah, we, we, now after we wrote our first two drafts, um, Columbia passed on it because it was too nice and too sweet. And mm. they were looking for, you know, stuff like Porky's and Stripes back then. Sure. And sure. Uh, they gave it back to us and we tried to set it up and, and it was rejected over 40 times. 40 um, times? Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> now, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the exact movie that we ended up making, there, we didn't have the DeLorean in it yet. Well, actually, in nineteen in early nineteen eighty one, the DeLorean was finally first coming off of the, uh, you know, c coming out of Ireland. So we yeah. that yeah. wasn't even in there. So there was a lot of things that were different. What was uh, the time machine? Uh, the time machine was a time chamber. It was built out of an old refrigerator, and the climax of the movie. Uh, was, and for a long time was, um, that the nuclear power that was required literally caused them to go to a nuclear test site in Nevada and harness the energy from an, a nuclear bomb test. And it's suspiciously like the opening yes. of Indiana Jones 4. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So wait a minute, wait a minute, because you just blew my mind. You're telling me that the original time machine was a refrigerator and um, there was a point in the movie where you guys had to go back to Nevada with the refrigerator to get the nuclear explosion. And that's the opening of Indiana Jones 4, because that's exactly what happens in Indiana Jones yeah. 4. 
That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So when when did the kind of thunderbolt um, hit for the DeLorean? Actually, we were already in pre-production with the movie uh, Universal in uh, in 1984. And so uh, Zemeckis was wearing his director's hat now, and he's thinking about, okay, the refrigerator has to go on the back of this pickup truck. Doc Brown has to lug it around. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of shots that I have to do to to get this story told. Right. And he came in the office one morning. He said, "Hey, Bob, wouldn't it make more sense if Doc Brown had built the time machine into a car, and then we don't have to do all this stuff with a pickup truck?" I said, "Yeah, that's a good idea." And he said, "And what if?" The car was a DeLorean. So happened that in uh, the late summer of 1984, John DeLorean was on trial uh, in that, you know, cocaine frame yeah, up, yeah. set up sting thing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it was it was total entrapment. And he uh, he got off because the jury said, yeah, it's entrapment. Yeah. And um, but he was, you know, he was notorious. He was on the news every night. And we thought, OK. This makes the car really dangerous <clears throat> because of the story of John DeLorean. Plus, let's face it, the car this is the coolest looking car we could imagine. To With this day. Doors, I mean, it's perfect, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and um, – yeah, first of all, you just blew me away with that whole you know refrigerator thing. I, I had never heard that before, and I'm I'm such a fan of of not only you guys but also Spielberg and especially Indiana Jones. Um, the the uh, obviously there's a lot of stuff about the movie that's already been talked about a bunch. Um, you know, Eric Stoltz, Michael J. Fox. Um, you guys, you know, shot a bunch with Eric Stoltz. My, you yeah, know, you can Michael. watch watch on Netflix the movies that made us. Back to yeah. the Future, they do a really good job of recounting that on there. So, yeah. yeah. Well, so, 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 for those of you that don't know that story, um, that's the best way to experience it. So, so to kind of skip ahead about that a little bit, um, when did you realize, okay, we've, we've not just made a cool picture that we're proud of, we've made a moment that's literally going to change pop the, the the entire trajectory of pop culture when did that like hit on you that was it after the release was it during the filming when did you know okay i've truly stumbled into a moment in time here well you, look you never know that let's face it it's it, back then even when the movie was a gigantic hit did, did it occur to us that you know 20 years later 30 years later, people would still be loving it and watching it. Cause you think about, you know, the movies of the sixties, um, what, what movies are from 1960, uh, are iconic in 1985, right? right. There aren't right. any of them. So you don't, even though there were big, you know, big movie hits then, um, you don't think in those terms. Uh, we did recognize, <clears throat> that Michael J. Fox was a much bigger deal than we really had any idea about sure, when we were sure. shooting uh, the high school scenes at Whittier High School. And we shot at Whittier High School Derek Stoltz during Christmas vacation of 1984. And, you know, nobody came to watch us shoot. We were back at Whittier High School in spring vacation 1985, and kids were lined up seven deep in hopes of getting a glimpse of Michael J. Fox. Sure. So Bob and I kind of said, wow, this kid's a really big star. Maybe people are actually going to show up at the theater. Then what happened, uh, and this is a phenomenon that doesn't happen anymore, but <clears throat> we opened in about 1,100 theaters uh, on July 3rd, 1985, Fourth of July weekend. Our opening gross weekend was like 10 million bucks. Uh, the following weekend, we did 11 or $12 million. Mm -hmm. So we did better the second weekend than the first, which meant that, okay, the word of mouth on this is incredible. Yeah. Because that yeah. never happens now because they open a movie, you know, on four or 5,000 screens at a time. Right. Um, right. We were the number one movie in America 
for 11 out of the first 12 weeks and played in theaters from July 1985 until March 1986. So that pretty staggering, pretty staggering. And and um, what one you know the in the original uh, Back to the Future were you on because since you and Rob uh, uh, you know since you and Samakas had this close relationship were you on set for most of the uh, filming every day every, every day, day. Huh? yeah absolutely because I'm I'm also one of the producers right right so, right yeah I'm I'm there all the time yeah. that's great that's great and. and Michael J. Fox, just just this is more of like a fan question, but that final scene where he does the Johnny B. Good stuff, I mean, that's like one of the reasons why, you know, why I play guitar. It was such a, a monumental moment. Um, that's him playing, right? Because he's um, – was that actually yeah. him? That's him playing. That's, well, he's playing it, but the actual guitar solo is performed by somebody else. Sure. He's, he's, you know, he's playing all the strings correctly. Yeah. Um, but it's it's somebody better than him, uh, you know, probably playing on better equipment than than what was actually there. Definitely playing on better equipment than what yeah. was there. Um, but yeah, if if any guitar player watching that will say, "My God, he's playing he's playing the notes that I'm hearing." Absolutely, yeah, he, he he practiced that you know for weeks and weeks and weeks to get that right. There's there's um. There's some footage um, not too long ago, maybe five, six years ago, of a Coldplay concert of Michael J. Fox coming on stage. Oh, yeah, uh, I've seen that. Coldplay yeah. credits that scene uh, with them becoming a band. And John Mayer, uh, he's always said that that scene inspired him to become a guitarist. So it's inspired a lot of folks oh, to man. pick up the guitar. So good. And... and, and you mentioned something about Michael J. Fox, like like working very hard to learn um, how to play guitar for that scene. During the time that you guys were filming Back to the Future, he was sh uh, 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 sharing his time with you guys with family ties. Um, was Michael J. Fox an extremely like focused, like high level work ethic type of guy? Like, how do you remember him on set in terms of oh, how well, he felt with the work? Look, uh, Michael J. Fox was was just fabulous guy to have around. He was just enthusiastic. Uh, he was happy to be there. Uh, he would, you know, do whatever we needed him to do. He brought tons to the party. And yeah. it, what, what was interesting about the way he worked compared to Christopher Lloyd, <clears throat> Christopher Lloyd is a theater trained actor. Uh, an actor that gets trained in, in theater they memorize the entire script, sometimes everybody else's part as well as their own, uh, before the first day of shooting. So Christopher knew his part backwards and forwards. Uh, Michael J. Fox had been trained on sitcoms. And on sitcoms, they're notoriously revising the script every day. Sure, so sure. Michael never learned his lines ahead of time because he had already learned, okay, there's no point in me memorizing this because they're going to change it the day before I shoot it. So he kept changing, you know, he, he didn't learn his lines until right before we were going to, the day before we were going to shoot. And um, uh, he was used to improv and Christopher was less used to that. So it was kind of an interesting dichotomy of the way those guys work. Now, of course, for something like the Johnny B. Good scene, he knew that that was always going to be part of the movie. So that was something that he could practice and that he could learn. And in between takes, when he was in his trailer, um, he would be, you know, practicing. And, and to your earlier point, and, and, you know, like I'd be, you know, I'd be an idiot if I didn't bring this up because it was so much fun. Um, the, the, the Leah Thompson uh, casting was that? Did you guys see a bunch of folks uh, to play that role? Was Leah recommended? How did she end up in the picture? Yeah, we saw a lot of we saw a lot of young young actresses, and uh, Leah was just she had this wonderful quality that just um, was there in person, was there on the on the taping that we did. Um, there was just some something both wholesome and sexy about her at the yeah, same yeah. time. And uh, it's an amazing performance. 
it's very subtle. You know, Michael and Christopher are very animated like that all the time. Right. And she's, you know, very understated. But, boy, you watch her. Just just watch her during the movie. And the stuff that she's doing, just incredible. Uh, and how she, where she got that, how she figured all that stuff out at her age, uh, uh, it still blows me away. Yeah, like, like especially because when you first see the character as um, Marty's mom, you buy into the fact that she's a middle-aged woman. And, and then you don't like, you know, like even as a kid, maybe because I'm remembering it as a kid, like I was completely convinced or, you know, the suspension of disbelief had completely overtaken me that this was an old woman when I first saw her. Um, and then when you see her as a teenager, it, it, it's mind blowing how different they are. And like, even like the, the makeup work back then was astounding. Like, you know, she looks like an adult versus the teenager, you know, later on, it was, you know, some, some, some amazing stuff. Now, how, how soon after um, back to the future one, did you guys already start working on the sequel? Was that the kind of thing where universal was like, this is too damn good. Let's start working on this even before this movie comes out. Or was there a little waiting period? Well, no, they they didn't look. The movie we had the after we wrapped principal photography, that was April 1985. The movie was in theater nine and a half weeks later. Mm. It was one of the shortest post-production periods. We ruined post-production in Hollywood for everybody else <laughs> because we got the movie out that quickly and it was that good. Um, so Universal didn't see the movie until, you know, five weeks before it opened, uh, six weeks before it opened, maybe. And that was when the head of uh, Scheinberg, the head of the CEO, he said, what's it going to take to get this movie open you know, on July 4th? Uh, because we were going to open on August uh, 16th. And we said money. <laughs> if right. I can't spend the money, we'll do it. And he said, I want to spend the money. It was one of the best best decisions Sid made to say, yeah, okay, let's, let's, uh, we had, we were working 24 hours a day. Uh, we had a wow. night crew uh, doing sound and a day crew. And we were working in the day, then pre-dubs at night. And um, so it was, I don't know, uh, a few months after the movie, after, I probably after the movie uh, had hit the $100 million mark is when, they started thinking sequel. Now Zemeckis had already signed on to do Roger Rabbit. Mm. And at a certain, we weren't sure whether we wanted to do a sequel or not. And finally, what Universal said to us, gentlemen, Scheinberg said, we are making Back to the Future Part 2. You can be on the bus or off the bus, but we're <laughs> making the picture. Right. So we said, all right, we're not, we're not going to let this be turned over to strangers. And we said, all right, here's here's well, here's our deal. Uh, as long as Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd are signed up for a sequel, we'll come up with a story. Uh, but if we don't have both of those guys, there's no point in doing a sequel. Mm -hmm. And Universal said, yeah, you're right. OK, uh, we'll go make those deals. And both of those guys said, as long as Zemeckis and Gale are involved, we'll we'll sign on. And uh, then, uh, then it was okay. Now, what are we going to do? Right. We and, and, never thought about it. And even though I, I, I understand that Back to the Future One is a perfect movie in the lore of cinematic history, Back to the Future Two is probably my personal favorite because, like, when I was a kid, it, it really kind of showed you, well, you know, what was possible in the future. You know, like from the you know the air mags you know with with nike that i'd love to ask you a little bit about that because i don't know if you're aware of this or not i'm sure you probably are but in the kind of sneaker culture scene oh yeah these, these air mags are like you know they sell for like eight nine thousand dollars you know like there was a small run of them made um and like they're like one of the most coveted shoes in the entire kind of shoe culture industry well um, that's what they were that they, they sold for that uh way back when they brought them out in uh, 2011 or 2000 
2012, whenever that was. Yeah. Uh, they had him for auction and it was to benefit Michael's foundation. And I think that the, I think that the starting bid for him was, you know, five or six thousand dollars. So, yeah, they they were always uh, they were always a big deal. And the process, you you guys, um, which was also kind of a a new thing in Hollywood back then. You guys shot two and three together, right? It was like one um, shoot, pretty much. It was like one schedule. Yes. Yeah, uh, and. and and did you have the scripts for two and three um, already oh, yeah. written, or were you oh, working? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah no, we and we got the idea. You know, I always give credit where credit is due. Uh, uh, Alexander and Ilya Salkine did the Three Musketeers and the Four Musketeers exactly that way, and they had planned to do Superman one and Superman two exactly that way. They ran out of money before they could finish Superman two, um, but they they. They really kind of pioneered that. And uh, we saw uh, Richard Lester's Three Musketeers. And at the end of Three Musketeers, there's a trailer for the Four Musketeers. And I remember vividly seeing seeing the Three Musketeers, which is the best version of that uh, property ever made. Uh, so, again, there's uh, something else for people to go search out. Um, and and when, we saw, when we saw the trailer for the – for the four musketeers, it was like, Oh my God, there's going to be another one. And here it is. Um, that got us really excited, yeah. which was a far cry from uh, when we saw the empire strikes back and walked out of the screening thinking Han Solo's in carbon freeze. Right. What the hell kind of ending is that? <laughs> right. What is that? What the hell? Uh, so we walked out of that kind of saying, that's, that's not, it's not a good way to end the movie. So when we realized we were going to do the second and third movies, we said we have to have a trailer for part three so that when you go see part two, you're not worried that there's not never going to be a part three. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a part three and you only have to wait six months for it. And here it is. And, and at the end of part one, you know, you see, obviously, you know, roads where we're going. We don't need any roads. It's one of the best final lines in movie history, in my opinion. Um, did you already kind of have the idea no. that? No, no, no. That's just, a satisfying ending. Um, as you know, from seeing the movie as a kid, you didn't care whether it was going to be another one or not. The right. roads ride off into the sunset, have another adventure. And right. as Zemeckis has said many times, if we knew back then that we were going to do a sequel, we would have never put Jennifer in the car because when it came time for us to write the sequel, we said, what are we going to do with Jennifer? Right. You know, it's just kind of a fifth wheel here. This, <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of, kind of stupid what we did, which uh, all right, we're just going to, we're going to knock her out. She's going to be unconscious. <laughs> right. the but, yeah, you know, yeah, we're going to throw her on the side of the road yeah, unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's so cool. Trash, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's so cool. Wow. Well, wow. thank you for that, Bob. For a second there, you just brought me into that moment with you back in the past, you know, so, so I really appreciate that. Um, but yeah, part two, part three, excellent stuff. Um, I want to be careful with your time. I know I only have about 15 more minutes with you. One thing that I, I've been dying to ask you, because if you look at your career, um, you also have a lot of involvement in the video game space. You know, you, you've done quite a bit of work in video games. Um, I used to know very well the guys over at um, Telltale Games um, who did the Back to the Future kind of story-based game back in the day. And I know that they worked with you on it. Um, and, and, and it always seems that when Back to the Future gets a video game that you take that very personally and that you actually want to make sure that these characters are well represented. Also, even in the TV show, in the animated TV show, you know, you were, you know, hands on with that. Um, what What are your feelings about the video game stuff? Well, look, the, I mean, I, look, I started playing video games uh, like everybody else. You know, Pong was fun, but then Space Invaders comes along and, okay, that's just unbelievably great. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I'm older than the, than the usual video game demographic for back then. But 
yeah, I love going to the arcade in the eighties and playing all those classic games. So, uh, you know, I had the Atari 2600, bought that. The Nintendo uh, NES system comes out. I bought that. And by the time we're into uh, Back to the Future, I, I'm trying to remember when the when the Nintendo video game came out. Um, I, it was probably around the time of Back to the Future Part Two. Yeah. And Universal... Um, made this deal with um, what it was LJN Toys. I think they were part owner of it, of that company. And the uh, the eight bit Nintendo Back to the Future game is truly one of the worst video games ever made. Um, mm-hmm. If you've ever seen the Angry Nintendo Nerd on YouTube, um, yeah. Yeah. he 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 did a segment on it, and it's great. Um, and this was one of those things where I would say, well, you're going to do a video game. Uh, I'd like to have some input. And they say, oh, what do you know about games? You're a movie guy. Forget it. We know what we're doing. And I said, well, yeah, I do know a little bit about games. I do play them at, at least. They said, no, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll do this. And it was crap. Uh, right. And they made a sequel uh, and they went to a claim on that. And that was crap. Um, um, and so – yeah, I took it real personally because, you know, Back to the Future is a brand name that people, you want them to believe in it. Of you want course. them to think that it it means it means something, that, that there's some quality behind it. So that was, that was, uh, when, when the, when the new guys, the, the great phenomena that happens uh, <clears throat> is that the fans grow up and they get these jobs working at these companies. So the guys that end up running Universal's game department, they're fans of the movie. And right. the guys at Telltale Games, they're fans of the movie. Uh, and the guys that we hired to work on the musical are fans of the movie. Right. So care about it. All, all these people are saying, we're not going to screw this up. This is our favorite movie. Yeah. Um, it's got to be really good. It's got to be worthy of the title, Back to the Future, that the board games that have come out in the last couple of years, um, they they may be a little overly complicated, but they correctly represent the franchise, sure. and they're made by people that care. So that's what happened. And when you know the guys at Telltale were told, well, Bob Gale wants to have some involvement with us, and they said, really? Yeah, they were excited. Yeah, 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 yeah. We want to we want to we want to talk to them about this, and. Uh, and, and actually, one of the things that happened was that when they started, they thought, "Oh, we're going to have this uh, take place in 2011." And I said, "No, no, no, no! You're not going to have it take place in 2011. It's got to be the Marty McFly that people know from the movies. It's got to start in like 1986." And they really suddenly they said, oh, "Of course, of course, it has to." And so. You know, I pulled out some old notes that we had for sequels, uh, possible sequel ideas. Uh, and Bob and I had come up with this idea about uh, having Marty and Doc go back to uh, Prohibition days. And that seemed to resonate. That was a good yeah. that was a good, uh, period to use. And so that was kind of the jumping off point. No, oh, that's really, oh, that's cool. really and, cool. And also in your credits, another uh, thing that I had never heard about, but you actually worked on an interactive movie back in the nineties and called Mr. Payback. That's right. So that's right. Does that medium uh, interest you? The kind of the concept of writing an interactive story, is that something that you're interested in, in, in pursuing? Um, if we can figure out a way to do it right. I mean, I think that it could probably work on Netflix now um, sure. where you use your remote to make choices. Uh, that's probably viable. Finally, um, we were way ahead of our time with Mr. Payback. And, uh, uh, you know, the kids understood it because kids that went, they were gamers. Um, uh, Roger Ebert uh, declared that I had destroyed cinema by (laughs) an interactive movie. And he forgot the fact is you can't choose to do anything in that movie that I don't want you to choose, right? Sure. <laughs> I had to film everything 
every version of the story that you're going to choose had to be scripted, had to be shot. So um, it was it was a really interesting uh, uh, experiment, shall we say. And yeah, there might be there might be a way to do it, but it just seems that people just want to sit, you know, sit and stream it or uh, whatever, watch something short on YouTube or on TikTok or whatever they're going to do, right? Yeah, I um so like my career started in the video game industry um, in earnest. I worked on Grand Theft Auto Vice City. I was one of the writers of that. Oh, cool! Um, Good for you. Yeah, Amazing yeah. game. Thank you. Um, and, and like for me, the concept of like interactive storytelling is, is such a is such a a powerful draw. It's my passion now, right? Club Metaverse is a massively multiplayer game in VR, right? So it's it's all about storytelling. And at Rockstar, me and my um, you know my boss um, had this brilliant idea that I became obsessed with that he wanted to uh, tell the story of Macbeth as a video game. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, and that he thought that that kids who would play through the story of Macbeth would be able to educate scholars on it better than the scholars know it because <laughs> the the experiential learning of it would take it to another level. And I, you know, big time agree with that kind of thinking. But um, the... Um, <laughs> Hey, did you ever see a movie called Scotland, Pennsylvania? Scotland, PA? It's no. Macbeth, it's Macbeth set in a burger joint. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> stream it on Amazon. It's, if, if, you're, if, if you like Macbeth. I um, love Macbeth. It's, 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 yeah, you'll love this. It's, uh, uh, you know, instead of McDonald's, it becomes Macbeth's. Yeah. Uh, it's... Oh, oh, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> me, me, and a writer named Terry George, um, who, uh, who, you know, you might know. He Terry wrote... George from Doctor Strangelove. No, no, no. He wrote, um, um, he wrote a movie called Hotel Rwanda. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 sure, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So Terry and I actually wrote an adaptation of 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 Macbeth because I was obsessed with this Macbeth thing, and, and, and we pitched it around, and we had some good producers on board. Never got it made, but. Um, Recently, I just saw that uh, Ethan Cohen, I believe, just came out with a with a new retelling of Macbeth, um, with Denzel Washington as as Macbeth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I, 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 I think I think uh, Francis McDormand is a little bit too old to play Lady Macbeth. Right. Uh, it kind of doesn't work because, you know, if if you watched, if you've seen the Michael Fassbender version of it. Uh, that that version is pretty great, and of course Polanski's version. Yeah, um, yeah. my favorite um, version is uh, is actually uh, um, Akira Kurosawa's version uh, called "The Throne of Blood." You know what? That's a great version of it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah very strong. Um, one one last thing here, while I still have you, um, you know, to think about the future a little bit. You mentioned Netflix. Back to the Future is obviously like you know, the crown jewel over at Universal still, right? Like after all these years, when you go to Universal Studios, everybody wants to go check out the clock tower. You know, it's still like, and like when people see the Lion Estate, like things like off to the side of Universal, it's still like one of the biggest attractions. Have you thought about, you know, putting on the cape again and like doing like a Netflix no. show? No. Yeah. They always ask us, no, we're not going to do that. Um, you know what? We're going to leave well enough alone. Um, the three movies are great the way they are. Uh, all that all that you're going to say is, "Gee, it's not as good as original." Um, right. Gee, why do they do that? Um, you know, Bob and I didn't want the Beatles to get back together after they <laughs> broke up because we said they were they were perfect when they were when they were the Beatles. Um, if they get back together, it's just not going to be as good. So right. Right. we've seen. Uh, too many franchises, they go back to the well one too many times, and you kind of say, gee, really, you know, did they need to do that? Do, do, uh, you know, is my life better for having having seen, you know, part four of something that was fine with just three parts? Um, so that's, that's actually the reason why we did the musical, because mm -hmm. the musical is a retelling of the first movie in a different medium. Sure. And... Sure. Nobody is going to confuse it with the movie. And yet for the audience experience that you had at the Arclight, which is, you know, 
Um, in the case of a musical theater, 1,500 people on a night, but, you know, at the Arclight, you probably had, you know, five or 600 people yeah. Uh, yeah. laughing out loud, enjoying this communal experience. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a fabulous, fabulous experience to have. You can have it when they, when they do Back to the Future in concert, uh, and that's when they run the movie with a symphony orchestra playing the score live. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, to to be there, we we had that at Radio City Music Hall for a couple of dates uh, several years ago, and it's it's it'll it'll come back as uh, as they uh, as COVID goes away and people are are more willing to go sit in a sit in a live theater performance. So yeah. that's why we did the musical so that you could have this communal exciting experience. It is Back to the Future. Nobody's going to walk out of the out of the musical theater. Uh, auditorium thinking that they saw anything other than Back to the Future, but it's retold with different tools, uh, with different paintbrushes, uh, and it's a musical, and it's great. Yeah. And so that's how we're going to give you, the public, more Back to the Future. And uh, when uh, things loosen up more in New York, we'll get the show brought over there. That's great. That's great. And we'll get a touring, you know, we'll get a couple touring productions. Knock on wood, we'll go all around the world with them. And uh, uh, that's an, a new way to experience Back to the Future. And that's, we're not going to make a part four. We're not going to make a prequel. We're not going to reboot it. Um, <laughs> we're leaving them well enough alone. Yeah, It's actually a trilogy that's going to remain a trilogy. People say to me, well, hey, Bob, how does it feel? You, you, you've got the best trilogy ever made. Well, the way things are going, it's going to be the only trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So this is complete non sequitur, but it seems like you and I are cut from the same cloth. Did you did you check out uh, the Beatles uh, Let It Be documentary by Peter Jackson? I have not watched that because oh, wow. I just thought it's it doesn't need to be eight and a half hours. Oh, it's so really? good. Is it? All right. I'll, I'll check it out. Then. Oh. I, I, it just, you know. But hey, you got to watch. I want to hold your hand. My God. Right. No. First of all, I am going to watch. I want to hold your hand. But speaking of time traveling, this is what I tell my my friends and my you know my bandmates. We're obviously all obsessed with the Beatles, um, and that documentary feels like time traveling because it's eight and a half hours of just being a fly on a wall with them arguing and bickering and playing music together. But if you're like a Beatle maniac, it's eight hours of content that you've never really seen before, you know? So, um, it, well, it but I have seen it because I remember Let It Be, which is which is what it was originally. Sure. Yeah, yeah. This is all the outtakes of, it's basically eight hours of outtakes of Let It Be. I know. I know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I mean, when I saw the trailer for it, I said, wait a minute, I've seen this movie before. It was called Let It Be, and I liked it. I liked it when I saw it in, you know, 1970, whenever it came out. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it, it, it's, you know, it's, you know, there's something really cool about time traveling, you know, about feeling like you could go back and like witness something that was never before possible. But in any case, uh, Bob, this is, this has been so much fun, man. I, I, uh, I really appreciate your time. I'm honored to get a chance to speak with you. Um, and hopefully we can do it again soon. And and I'll, I'll follow up with you offline because I'm doing some really cool stuff in video games and I'd love for you to check it out. Um, okay. Because it seems like video games is a bit of a passion for you. That, well, that, yeah. I mean, now I, I will admit that I haven't progressed much beyond PlayStation 3. Um, the games started to get so complicated and I, you know, I don't, I, I don't have the reflexes to do this stuff online with their, with all all the 10 and 11 year olds who can kick my ass <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you you worked with rockstar games i gotta say one of my favorite rockstar games was la noir oh which great I, game i i wish that more people would do stuff like that because the coolness of driving around the streets of la but being back in the thirties or forties, whenever it takes place yeah. to know, okay, you know, here's where La Brea Avenue is and here's the intersection of sunset and La Brea. Oh my God, they recreated it 
exactly the way that it was. When we talk about a way to do time traveling, exactly. that to me was one of the coolest games ever. And I'm just, I, I wish that m- that could be done more because that. One thousand percent. Right now, I'm working, and and it's okay to talk about it. Like, there's no more secrets in in media, but yeah. I'm actually working on a game uh, called Exodus. Um, that's part of my big VR world, and in Exodus, you play as Moses, uh, leading <laughs> leading your your people out of Egypt. You know, and like to walk around. It's it's in a very early rough stage, but to walk around and seeing those pyramids like in full scale in the white because, you know, they were painted white back in the day and like gets, gets you that feeling of like, you know, to your point, the like the simulation. There's actually a VR version of L.A. Noir that Rockstar made um, uh, recently. Um, do you have you ever played VR? Have you ever used VR? I don't like putting the headset on because mm-hmm. I wear glasses and it's not comfortable. Sure. And I, it just it just. I, I'm, I never, I, I could never get comfortable with it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. But VR is, uh, is, 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 is pretty special. Maybe when my game comes out, I'll, I'll, I'll ship you out a headset um, with like a special rig so that you can use it with your glasses and, um, and you can check it out. Okay. That would be cool. All right. That would be cool. Awesome. Bob, thank you so much for your, for, for your time. You've been extremely generous. Um, Bob, is there anything you want to shout out? Anything, uh, um, you know, books, anything that you got cooking? Because the the musical, we can't go see yet, right? So we got to wait. No, you can't go see the musical yet, but the cast album will be out uh, first week in March. I think the street date is March 5th. Um, Cool. So if you're a Back to the Future fan, you want to get a sense of what the musical is all about. uh, It's really terrific. We just, uh, we're just uh, signing off on the final mixes. Uh, right now, and uh, um, people that have not seen the show uh, at Sony Records hearing this, they, they're they just totally pumped, totally excited about it. So I'll put in a plug for that. And, um, yeah, if you need an excuse to go over to London, um, <laughs> right. you know, Back to the Future of the Musical is, is, is a great excuse. London's a great city. Uh, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. Right, uh, right. And uh, uh, yeah, you can get into the country and they don't check your vaccination status. Uh, you can pretty much do whatever you want there. So yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good place. Good place to go. Uh, if if, uh, if you're tired of being in Florida. So, yeah, well, look, one day, if you ever make it to Florida, you have to let me know because I want you to sign my DeLorean, maybe somewhere classy, like inside. But I actually have a DeLorean. Um, sitting in the garage. I haven't used it in a criminally long time, to be perfectly honest with you, because it's it's actually one of the most impractical cars ever invented. It's true. It's you true. <laughs> well, you let me know if if you want to do a get a Back to the Future conversion on your car. Um, there's there's a guy uh, there's a guy in Florida who does uh, who does great work. So I'll, interesting. I'll turn you on to him if you're interested in that. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Thank you all to all the listeners, and we will see you guys soon. In the future.